Welcome, dear colleagues. Uh, I am glad you could join us today for this new edition of the EORI Hour. My name is Faustine Auger. I am the Secretary of the Explosive Ordinance Risk Education Advisory Group. And on behalf of the EORI Advisory Group, it is my pleasure to introduce this new EORI Hour webinar. Uh, can you can you confirm that you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Yes, yes. This is great. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. So as I said, I'm uh, very happy to kick off this uh, webinar today. And for those of you who join for the first time, the EORI Hour webinar series is an initiative that was launched at the end of 2021 by the advisory group. The webinars take place every last Wednesday of every month for which we have volunteers to present on a chosen topic. We had five webinars organized in 2021 and 2022, and this is the second one for 2023. The last webinar took place in September and explored new resources for digital EORE. And for those who could not attend or who would like to review past webinars, we invite you to watch the recordings online on the Advisory Group YouTube channel. Today's topic is promoting behavioral change using alternative EORE methodologies, a case study from Iraq. Uh, this EORE hour is hosted by Humanity and Inclusion, best known as HI. And our speakers today are Sofia Kogolos, Hani Nazim, and Eloise Pieri. Uh, I am very excited about this webinar. The issue of behavior change is central to risk education, and new methodologies have been tested in this respect over the last few years. I am personally looking forward to learning more about HI's approach in Iraq and experience. Once again, we hope that today's discussions will inspire you or help or help you overcome some challenges that you may face in your projects. And uh, as for the last webinar, this webinar will be one hour and will be followed with a 15 minute uh, networking circle to give the chance to make connections with other professionals working on risk education around the world. You, we really hope that you will be able to stay for this part too. And before handing over to Sophia from HI, um, I just want to share a few final logistics notes. So we kindly ask you to keep your mics mute during the presentations, and we invite you to submit your questions in the chat, directly in the chat as we go. There will be a Q&A session after the presentations of the different speakers, uh, taking up the questions raised in the chat. In case all questions submitted in the chat are not addressed due to time constraints, the remaining questions will be compiled and answered in writing by the speakers after the webinar and the response circulated through the EORI Hour mailing lists. As for, for previous EORI Hour webinar, this webinar is recorded, except for the networking circle part, and will be available online on the EORI Advisory Group's YouTube channel at a later date. In case of technical issues, please contact me or my colleague Ines Burki in the chat for assistance. And I will now hand over to Sofia. And I wish you all a fruitful and inspiring EORI hour. And Sofia, it's it's up to you now. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning for those in this part of the world. Um, thank you so much, Faustine, for the introductions. Uh, we are really happy as a child to have the chance to share our experiences uh, here in the, um, in the URI hour, and I hope this will be a really productive uh, session for all of us. I will share my screen now. Please confirm you can see it. Yes, we can. Just need to make sure. Just a second, because I forgot something important to share the sound. It should be working now. Okay, good. We're good to go. Okay, so today we will be speaking about uh, promoting behavioral change using alternative risk education methodologies. Uh, as Fausti mentioned, I will be here today with my colleagues, uh, Hanin and Eloise. We all had the chance to be in the field implementing this. Um, so 
Uh, I think we are all super lucky to hear the experiences from the field uh, today. Um, so just briefly, the, the structure of the session will be this one. So first we will do a short introduction about HI. Then we will see briefly what is the context uh, of Iraq, where we were uh, conducting these activities and why we were conducting these activities. Then we will go into detail about the activities that we conducted, presenting like what we did from the traditional perspective of risk education, then what we did with community focal points, community safety committees, the alternative behavior projects that we implemented. And then we will have um, a presentation on the challenges and lessons learned. And we will have some part for all of us to uh, discuss a bit and answer some of the questions that you might have. Um, I will appreciate if you do the questions at the end. Also, if you leave the questions in the chat, um, our team will be following up so we can answer uh, at the end. So first of all, um, you have, I guess some of you have, have heard about uh, humanity and inclusion in the past. It's an organization founded by French doctors in 1982. These doctors were working in refugee camps on the Thai Cambodian border. So this organization is born uh, with a big concern of the impacts of a uh, anti-personal mind in, in communities. We have been working for more than three decades uh, in a comprehensive way to support uh, people that has a uh, face impairment uh, as a result of a uh, explosive ordnance, but also we have worked to prevent those injuries. Um, we work in situations where there's conflict and disaster, but also other situations where, where there is a, a lot of population with huge vulnerability due to poverty and exclusion. Uh, we are uh, founders, uh, co-founders of a uh, international campaign to ban landmines, and also uh, co-founders of the Cluster Munition Coalition. And we work uh, in four of the five pillars of mine action. Um, our component um, where we integrate mine action uh, in HI is called armed violence reduction. Uh, we have a comprehensive way uh, of mine action where we feel all the components should be uh, implemented in an integrated way and also we add to the traditional pillars of mine action, a conflict transformation component to address not only the consequences of conflict, but also the root causes to prevent these uh, situations to continue happening in the future. Uh, currently we have uh, armed violence reduction uh, programs in 32 countries. Um, and you can see in the map that in some areas we implement four of the pillars of action but in others we implement only one or two. It depends uh, in the situation of the country and of course also the available funds. Here you can see a list of our uh, usual uh, donors for this kind of activities. In particular in Iraq, we have been working since 1991. Um, okay. Uh, so we have been working in Iraq since 1991, and specifically in Mine Action, we have been working since 2016. Uh, we are currently implementing our AVR activities in three governorates uh, that you can see in the map, Anbar, Ninewa, and Salahadin. And you can also see in the map Kirkuk, because we recently closed, it, closed this base, but we did really important uh, part of the activities that we were uh, we will be sharing today there. Uh, we had the opportunity to implement activities there, there in a comprehensive way because we had land release activities, victim assistance uh, activities, and also the risk education component. So there's a lot of lessons learned from our activities conducted in that area. And also in Iraq, we have our coordination office in Erbil, and we have also a coordination office in Baghdad, where we liaise uh, with uh, the government in the national level. I will give the, give the floor now to my colleague, Hani, eh, to explain a bit about the context of Iraq. 
Yes, hello everyone. Are you hearing me well? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. So this is uh, Hanin Mughdad, um, uh, the Exclusive Ordinance Risk Education Project Manager uh, in HI Iraq uh, Ninawa base. So I will go with you to talking about the armed violence context in Iraq. It start with the uh, exclusive ordinance contamination in Iraq. So uh, despite uh, the extensive effort by um, a humanitarian partner to clear the exclusive ordinance contaminated area, but uh, Iraq still now have uh, a high number of contaminated land, approximately about like 3,060 kilometers square of land uh, remain contaminated. And the full extent of contamination till now is undefined. Uh, as well in Iraq, there, uh, there is mine legacy mined area from uh, the 1980 to 1988 uh, war with Iran, uh, the 1991 Gulf War, and the uh, 23 innovation of Iraq by the United uh, States. Uh, as well, uh, the barrier minefield along with the border of Iraq with uh, Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. In addition uh, for that, uh, further extensive contamination with improvised uh, mine and other exclusive uh, devices um, after the Islamic State occupation on several governorate in Iraq uh, on uh, 2014. Um, as well, this is contamination uh, caused a high number of accidents. Uh, and according to the Directorate of, uh, of Mine Action data, uh, we have approximately uh, 38,000 people are reported as victim of an exclusive ordinance uh, exclusion in the country. Uh, as well, we have 437 uh, persons were reported as a victim in 2021. Um, which represented uh, a concerning uh, uh, increase compared to the 51 uh, victim reported in 2020. Uh, as well, it's essential to mention that people with disability caused by exclusive ordinance accident uh, and their family continue to, uh, to lack access to the specialized victim uh, assistance. Uh, as well, with all affirmation and following 40 years of uh, work, uh, Iraq uh, considered as uh, as the world most exclusive ordinance contaminated countries, um, and uh, also it's important to remember uh, that uh, Iraq in the last year and currently uh, experienced decrease in the humanitarian fund in the humanitarian fund. So next slide, please, Sophia. So let's talk also about the conflict uh, context in Nineveh. So uh, Nineveh is, co is a governorate in northern of Iraq, as uh, seen in the map. Uh, also is the second highest populated governorate in Iraq, with an estimated 4 million people living in uh, Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh in Iraq is a diverse region, like there is Arab, uh, uh, Christian, Assyrian, Yazidi, and uh, as well, uh, Muslim, Sunni, and Shia living in uh, Nineveh Governorate. Uh, ISIS occupied uh, Nineveh, uh, I mean the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, occupied Nineveh in June uh, 2014. And after this is uh, occupied on uh, Nineveh, and this is the ISIS conflict, uh, causes mass displacement in this is Governorate, which leading to a humanitarian crisis as people need for shelter, food, healthcare, and uh, basis, uh, basic service. Yes, next please. So on uh, 2017, uh, the, prime, uh, the Iraqi Prime Minister officially announced the liberation of Nineveh from ISIS. And after the defeat of ISIS, so efforts were made to stabilize and reconstruct the uh, area. Uh, this is involved ERE uh, uh, awareness session, demining, rebuilding uh, infrastructure, and supporting uh, the return of civilians to uh, Nineveh Governorate. Um, as you know, after each crisis or war, uh, um, multiple NGOs launch their working in Iraq. So multiple humanitarian mine action NG, uh, organization working in the area after uh, defeat ISIS. Uh, as well, uh, now Nineveh's contamination is combined uh, by, uh, like, uh, especially by IED and uh, other conventional ordinance, 
so this is need a lot of effort to clearance uh, to clear and uh, this is area. Thank you. The floor for uh, Sophia. Thanks a lot, Tani, for sharing this uh, information with us. Um, so we will go into detail about the risk education activities that we have been uh, conducting in Iraq uh, with a focus on the activities conducted in Ninewa Governorate. Um, so as HI, we implement different setup of risk education activities depending on the context. So when we are in an emergency, an open conflict, situation, we implement risk education in a emergency setup as uh, I think all the sector um, is doing. So uh, the main focus is to provide clear warnings to the maximum of people and raise awareness. So it's really focusing like sending messages uh, as much as possible to as many people as we can. Um, then in situations of recovery and post-conflict, the focus uh, is on developing local capacities to raise a uh, sustainable and suitable awareness in highly impacted communities. And then when we are in development context, um, the idea is to continue with uh, uh, the sustainability of the, of the risk education activities and also uh, giving capacities to the communities to manage their residual risks in the case that a, a land release has been conducted. Um, and I explain this because uh, we, we have been in Iraq in all of these stages. So we started implementing these traditional risk education activities since 2016, where we were doing mainly direct sessions, media campaigns, so delivery of a risk education risk education uh, messages. Then since 2019, we started focusing in building capacities, training local uh, members of the communities uh, and providing materials to conduct risk education activities. And then since 2020, we started to go a bit beyond uh, with, um, um, yeah, with more like in a, in a development context, uh, starting to focus more in like supporting the communities um, for development and how from mine action we could yeah support um, this this transition of the communities. So for traditional risk education, I will explain super quickly since uh, I know this is what we are mainly doing uh, in the sector in all the organizations. So something really important is um, to choose the villages where we work. We have a couple of tools for needs assessment. So we start doing uh, with the support of local authorities and local leaders, a village profile. And then, uh, based on the profiles of the villages that we were uh, told are the most affected and also based on the, on the data that we have available, uh, we do a prioritization tool and then we define in which areas we want to focus our intervention. Then in those areas, we conduct a knowledge, attitudes, and practice survey, a CAP survey, where, um, yes, the idea is to see uh, what are the common, uh, common risk behaviors, who is mainly at risk, but also this CAP survey that we apply at the beginning and at the end will allow us to uh, know a bit about the impact of the whole intervention. And in some areas, we also do a socioeconomic impact survey to check the impact that the explosive ordnance contamination uh, had in the area. Um, then once we have all of this information, we uh, start conducting sessions with our own staff. Uh, usually we have mixed gender teams and these teams did mainly house to house sessions and sessions in schools. We also do some other sessions uh, for communities. We do some sessions sometimes outside areas where a lot of people is going, for example, outside hospitals. Uh, but these two are the main um, activities that we do, house to house sessions and school sessions. And for media campaign, we have done a lot of things and the usual radio messages, TV messages, um, social media, we have done posts with videos, with uh, 
infographics, etc. Uh, wall paintings outside the schools, billboards in areas where a lot of cars are, are moving, posters, flyers, small business cards that we give to adults uh, for them to keep with the main messages and the contact number of the national authority, children magazine, t-shirts, a pencil case, etc. So it depends uh, what in what we identify during the needs assessment, what could be the best way of deliver those me messages in each uh, community. Uh, this is an example of one of the world paintings that we did in, in Kirkuk. Then, um, uh, as I was mentioning, we start uh, to implement since 2019, activities more focused in building capacities for the communities to manage the risks posed by explosive ordnance. So um, this comes from the approach of community-based risk education that aims to put community members at the center of the awareness raising process uh, and the behavior, behavior change process. Uh, the idea of this then is to work with local people who are motivated to volunteer to help to make a difference for their communities. And then uh, for this, we select and train what we call community focal points. Uh, I know other organizations call them volunteers. It's basically the same. Um, and then we are talking about community members voluntarily join our activities and are trained to provide risk education messages to their communities and to mobilize uh, uh, the community to work to reduce the risk. Um, they receive a set of materials also to conduct these activities. And you can see in the photo uh, a CFP member holding a risk education session for women and children. Um, so this is a summary of the activities that we do. So we start selecting with the community, with the leaders, uh, the community focal points mainly local leaders and teachers who will provide the sessions at the schools. Then we do a training. We have a specific training package for teachers and we have a specific training package for uh, community leaders. Um, and we usually do the sessions uh, separated. Um, then these community focal points conduct the sessions uh, in their communities. Uh, with their families, with their friends, in their villages. And uh, we do close um, technical support. We do quality assurance, vis assurance visits um, to check how are they doing the sessions, what are they missing, if they are missing any kind of training or support from our side. And uh, usually we try to do lessons learned um, gatherings at the end of the project to improve and to see what worked well and what should be done better in the future. And if there is a need, we also do refresher sessions with this uh, community focal points. Um, since we are focusing uh, today uh, in the experience of Ninoa Governorate, so from 2019 to 2023, we trained 174 community focal points in different districts and sub-districts in Ninewa. So you can see here in the photo, Hanin and her team of community focal points. And um, yeah, uh, then uh, a female and a male conducting the, the risk education activities um, in the schools and with their communities. Um, we wanted to share with you the experience of one of our community focal points, um, Mr. Zaid Al-Bayati. Uh, he's a human development trainee, trainer. Uh, he's a highly effective, active, persistent, and motivated community focal point uh, working with us. Um, he, he's actively working to raise awareness among his community about the dangers of explosive ordnance. And like he, his goal is to educate people about the risk posed by EO. And we want to share with you a little testimony that he recorded for us. So please confirm if uh, you can hear and see the video. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Zaid Al-Bayati, one of the members of the community, the community of the United States, and the community of the United States. In the beginning of the day, I was born in the community of the United States, on the way of the community of the United States. 
السوشيال ميديا استقبال الاصدقاء والاهالي قريتي مره من مراتب معيه فريق تطوعي قمنا بالالصاق على المباشرات على المدارس على المساجد في مفترقات الطرق ساهمنا لحد ما تقليل مخاطر الالغام ولدينا لقاءات دوريه مع المنظمه ومع الزملاء في مختلف مناطق هنا من مدينه الشورى وحمام العليل وتل العفا وتل العفا وسهلنا و وكلاء في داخل احياء مدينه الموصل نحن نامل ان تكون مدينتنا خاليه من اي لغم في المستقبل القريب Um, yes, so this um, uh, this was a testimony of our community focal point in Ninewa. Um, it was really nice uh, to meet him and the rest of the of the community focal points um, in a refresher and lessons learning session that we did um, in I don't remember so well, honey. I think it was July. Uh, and how motivated they are, how much they value to have the chance to, to share this knowledge with their communities. And I will give the floor back to Hanin to explain a bit to us what yes. uh, are the community safety committee. Yes. Hi, Ben. So uh, here we're talking about the community safety committee. Uh, what is uh, the definition of this committee? The aim of created the, the community safety committee, uh, CSC, as also who compromises the community safety committee. So let's. is impacted by, by explosive hazard. And uh, the main aim of uh, creating this is a committee is to reduce the negative impact caused by explosive ordinance, including ED, uh, by reinforcing the local capacity and uh, empowering the community to face the risk and the consequence of the risk caused by such weapon. Um, a, a CSC uh, representation six age and disability who during and after HI finish uh, their activity in the specific target location. Um, in addition, the CSC will be supported by HI. Uh, through a monthly uh, uh, meeting or bi-monthly uh, meeting, CSC to maintain the community safety plan. So the, all the members in the CSC, they are not working alone, will be guided and supported by HI staff. Uh, with the plan, so let's, say, let's see what is the community safety plan. It's a plan to be used by the community safety committee uh, for the purpose of supporting their community and uh, prioritize related to explosive ordinance contamination and promoting improve, uh, improve safety within their community, within, uh, sorry, within their uh, The CSC, as I mentioned, would be uh, supported by HI to implement the safety, quick uh, safety uh, project based on recommendation of the CSC and in line with the HI criteria. Next uh, slide, please, Sophia. So this is the proposed uh, process uh, for community safety uh, committee. Uh, we have a uh, first step, as you know, uh, in, in all risk education project, we have uh, several uh, uh, like villages or neighborhood to target it during the project. So to select it or we need to select it only one location. So uh, what we have, uh, using to identification uh, the CSC location. So we have a prioritization tool and village profile tool. Uh, so HI will using all the information collecting during this assessment uh, to uh, like selected the three top location 
with the highest amount of reported uh, exclusive, uh, cont exclusive ordinance contamination. Uh, also, uh, this is location should have lack of current reporting uh, mechanism for exclusive ordinance and uh, victim, but also with large uh, population size. The second uh, step to uh, is selection of the CSC member. Uh, uh, sorry, in the we we still in this uh, first step. We have another uh, assessment. Uh, we have the physical assessment. So in this is assessment, uh, HI visit. Uh, this is the location uh, to see the level of destruction. Uh, what is the service uh, are available in this location? Uh, as well, in addition, focusing on the presence or absence of the rec recreational area, uh, such as a playground, park and football court, uh, checking if there is a school, if there is school need for rehabilitation or not, uh, there is health center and etc. Uh, as well, there is uh, the final step to, to uh, select the location of the CSC. We have the community survey. So this is a survey is uh, conducting with the, uh, with the community to assess the willing, willing, willingness of the participants uh, to participate and for volunteer to be a part of the community. Uh, after that, we select the location uh, to create the community safety committee, committee. The second step is to select the CSC member. So we have uh, two tools to select this is a member. We have volunteer and voting tool. So I will going to share the volunteering uh, form with the community through appropriate uh, mean uh, according to the community. Uh, for example, uh, sharing this is form uh, through the social media, through a post, uh, like post, uh, put it poster in the area, also maybe through asking for support from the Mukhtar or the leader of the community. Uh, then uh, after uh, uh, like uh, sharing the volunteer form and receiving the list of the people who is willing to participate in the CSC, we'll also share the voting form uh, to allow for the people and the community to voting on the member they need. So then we'll uh, going to uh, like create the CSC member, uh, the, this each CSC should contain uh, eight uh, people. Uh, uh, for men and for women, and also uh, should engage person with disability in this is uh, community. Uh, after that, we're going to the third step is the first uh, CSC meet meeting after creating the uh, the community. So in the first uh, meeting, we'll introduce HI and the project, and also we'll explain for the CSC member uh, about uh, uh, their role and responsibilities as well with we'll explain uh, why we chosen this is a member from their community. Uh, then give them uh, a brief about the exclusive ordinance risk education messages uh, and uh, give them time for a question and discussion uh, with them. Uh, after that, we we'll select another meeting with them uh, in order to submission uh, safety project. So in this is uh, in this is a step we're going we'll have only one uh, uh, template to use is the quick safety project template. Uh, so through discussing with the with the community member, we'll uh, uh, like explain for them what we mean by the quick impact project and quick safety project. So the quick safety project are a small project idea that are developed by the CSC and the community with support with HI. The aim of this is a project, as we mentioned before, is to reducing the impact uh, and the negative impact of the exclusive ordinance uh, and especially IED uh, through uh, have a suggestion from the CSC member. Uh, after uh, have suggestion with lead by HI staff, we're going to select uh, the quick impact project. So in this is a step, the selection of the project. Uh, this is, will be only between the um, HI uh, uh, members. So we'll have maybe the project manager of the, uh, the and the area major, the technical unit as a channel to uh, to to uh, like uh, review all the suggestions. Uh, quick safety project and then giving a scoring for this is a project and finally select only one project to implement it in this area. Uh, 
After the select the project, we uh, should uh, like contacting another meeting with the committee safety committee to inform them about the project uh, and uh, asking for their uh, support to uh, coordinate and liaison with the relevant authorities to get approval, also to select a space or land to implement this is a project, uh, to select this is a project. After that, we'll uh, go into the other step is community safety plan. So uh, in several meetings, as I mentioned with the CSC, we'll fill the community safety plan uh, and also uh, talking with the people about their role to uh, like following the implementation of this is a quick safety project and support HI in uh, uh, in like uh, lead this is a project after HI finish their work and leave from the area. Uh, finally, we'll uh, go to the exit plan or scale up the plan. So uh, I agree with the CSC uh, about uh, their rules and the com commitment to the lead. This is a quick safety project uh, as well. Uh, contact uh, listen learn workshop uh, to uh, like uh, select all the challenge uh, and barrier face also during the project to improve the next project. So uh, kindly go to the next. Yes. So in Ninawa, um, in total, we created seven CSC since two, uh, 2021 to 2023. So uh, HI created one community safety committee in Mosul, in, uh, in Mosul district, in Sherfa neighborhood. Uh, as well, we conducted, uh, we created a three uh, community safety committee in Sinjar, one in Dukri, Barbaroj, and another one in Tel Ozer. Uh, this is in 2022-2023. Uh, as well, HI uh, uh, created one CSC in Telkev district, uh, one sub-district uh, in 2021. Uh, as well, we have two uh, uh, CSC created in Tel uh, in Ayadiyya sub-district in 2023. Sophia, the floor for you now. Okay, thanks a lot, Hakeem. Um, and then, as Hani was explaining a bit about the alternative behavior projects or quick impact projects, quick safety projects, uh, we we gave them a, a few different names <laughs> during the implementation uh, of the activities. But um, basically, um, as you mentioned, uh, it's developed by the CSC, by the Community Safety Committee. Um, and it comes with the intention of addressing those causes uh, of the of the unsafe behaviors that go beyond um, the fact that people is not aware of the presence of the explosive ordnance, right? So, in a scenarios where we are facing protracted crisis or development context, such as the one in Iraq, we see people is aware of the contamination, but they somehow get used to it right, or are forced to continue uh, having unsafe behaviors because they need to go uh, to farm uh, to, to bring some food for their families, etc. So these projects uh, come with the intention of, okay, how can we support the communities also um, to, to change the behaviors uh, beyond telling them this is the right thing to do, also, uh, we can support you to do that change. Um, so it starts, as Henning was mentioning, as a discussion in the CSC, uh, about the main drivers of the unsafe behavior. So who is at risk? Why are they taking those risks? Uh, they propose different projects. Uh, and of course, those projects uh, must be uh, defined or selected, taken into account. Uh, the um, the possible impact that they might have on the behavioral change, but also the budget. They are really small uh, initiatives, uh, and they should benefit uh, not one but a like a few members of the community. So it should be something uh, with that uh, three elements of uh, criteria, right? So promote promote behavioral change, uh, benefit a wide number of the communities. Uh, of the community member, members be conflict sensitive. So the creation of this um, project shouldn't cause um, any additional tension uh, in, the, in the community. 
and it must be according to our budget. Mm. And for example, just quickly in the photo that you see there, you can see some of the playgrounds that we did in Kirkuk um, to, to provide safe spaces for the children to play and not to play in unsafe areas. Um, so in general, the at-risk groups that we usually identify in Iraq, uh, so the, the communities uh, normally highlight a lot uh, that the children uh, are uh, at risk because they might be unaware uh, of the contamination or unaware of the safe behaviors to have. And, uh, as a result of the conflict, they, they lack of areas to play, safe areas to play. Um, then we have shepherds, farmers, uh, hunters who are economically forced uh, to uh, work in, in unsafe areas or in areas where there is a possibility of contamination. And it might be because they are forced or there might be also due to misinformation about the safe behavior. So a lot of times they know this, they know the areas are contaminated, uh, but they feel the contamination might be too old or that they know how to handle um, the situation. Uh, so it can be both. It's not always because they are forced as far as we have seen. Uh, we also have picnickers. So in certain uh, parts of the year where the weather is nice, um, people in Iraq tend to go to with all the family to certain areas to picnic, and then um, those areas might have contamination. And in a lot of cases, they don't really know about the contamination in the area, or they might feel again that since that happened a couple of years ago, there's no longer a risk. Um, something that we see quite often is the scrap metal collection. And this is an activity where uh, teenagers are usually involved. So um, we would say teenagers are usually reckless or we, when we explain, right, uh, in, in risk education, the categories of uh, risk takers, we tend to put teenagers as, as the reckless uh, uh, in, um, yes, that they engage in unsafe behaviors because they are reckless. But, Really, it's also due to economical reasons. Um, in this country, um, the teenagers, I, I don't know, around 16, they are. They also have some kind of pressure to start working. Uh, and then they engage in like collecting uh, scrap metal to support the family. So it's also it also needs to be addressed uh, from, yes, we do awareness. Uh, yes, we try to provide. Um, messages and information that uh, will encourage these teenagers to change their behavior, but it also should be addressed from the socioeconomic perspective because they might be forced to engage in such um, behaviors. And then we also have herb collectors in the same way as shepherds, farmers who are forced to, economically forced to engage in such behaviors. Um, so we did, uh, Really nice, interesting projects uh, in Ninewa. And I want to give the floor back to Hanin again to explain in more detail uh, what kind of projects we did and what were the reasons behind the, the, the selection of each project. Yes, Sofia. So um, here we have a picture of uh, several uh, safety projects implemented uh, in Ninewa from 2021 to 2020. So in the first uh, picture, we have a playground uh, implemented in Calapa in 2023. This is a playground uh, actually recently implemented in the village of Osterai in Ayadlia subdistrict uh, of uh, Calapa district. So actually, this is uh, implemented to reduce the impact of its exclusive ordinance uh, separated in several uh, area around the village and the community. And uh, there is a lot of, uh, and also because there is absence of any re uh, recreational uh, area for the children. So the children go into the open area to play, uh, as well the family going to picnic in this is open area, and that uh, made them at the risk 
of uh, uh, exclusive ordinance. So to reduce this is risk, so I, I uh, after creating the community safety committee and discussion uh, and local discussion with them, so we we uh, implemented this is uh, uh, playground in uh, for the um, uh, the second picture. This is uh, a park established in Tel uh, in Qahtania sub district in uh, Sanjar uh, district. So uh, this is, uh, um, I don't know if you know that Tel Ozer is highly contaminated by uh, improvised exclusive device. And there is uh, a huge number of uh, accidents, especially on the children, uh, because most, uh, most the family in this is area, they have a very bad uh, economic situa uh, situation. So they are sending their uh, children uh, to walking as a shepherd uh, in the open area. And most of the children they are affected by exclusive ordinance. So uh, HI after a created community safety committee in uh, Tel Ozer, and this is the uh, committee created uh, with the volunteer of uh, Tel Ozer Youth Center. So they are uh, requested with the community to uh, establish a safe place uh, for uh, their family and children uh, to come to this area. Uh, uh, as a recreational area, so it, I am going to establish this as a park in, uh, in Tel Ozer uh, because also the Tel Ozer uh, Youth Center uh, volunteer will go in to provide uh, and uh, deliver some activity in this, this is a park. Uh, for example, uh, deliver risk education awareness session for the families and children in this is a park. So uh, in the in the third uh, picture, we have. Uh, uh, HI is working on the rehabilitation municipal uh, park in Msherfa neighborhood in Mosul district. So uh, actually in uh, around this area, there is a big trench. Uh, this is a trench uh, uh, like uh, created by uh, ISIS during uh, occupied Mosul. And this is trench is full of uh, IED, it improvised exclusive device. Uh, as well, there is uh, there is the area near from this is a uh, trench used to uh, throwing the rubble, uh, and uh, this is, this rubble contain many exclusive ordinance and IED. And because most children go into this, this area maybe to play, or also uh, there are some of these ch children working as a scrub uh, metal collector. So uh, HI after creating the community safety community. Uh, working on the rehabilitation this park to attract the children to coming and play in this park and uh, avoid going to this is a contaminated area. Next, please. Yeah. Uh, here we, uh, HI working in, in uh, fixing or rehabilitation of a broken water pipe in uh, Salhia village in Tel Afar district. This is implemented this year in 2023. Uh, actually, in the, uh, this is area on most uh, land uh, around this area con is highly contaminated. Uh, and because this is the main like, water pipe uh, for this uh, for feeding, like this is a community. So after working most the community of Salhia, they are uh, going uh, to contaminated areas to bring water for their houses and their uh, Families. So, uh, I after uh, coordinate with the uh, like committee safety committee created in this area, uh, we uh, like decision to uh, rehab station this is water park. Uh, but as uh, I don't have experience in water uh, like uh, so we received uh, highly support from solidarity, uh, which support us to coordinate with the water department. As well in uh, writing the bill of responsibility of uh, this is something, uh, and then as I implemented uh, and re uh, repair this is water pipe. Yes, next please. Yeah. Um, here we have the uh, volleyball. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, this is established in uh, in twenty twenty one. Uh, in, sorry, in twenty twenty. Uh, in Tukri, this is a region in Sinjar. Uh, actually, in this area, uh, the people they are very love the volleyball, and uh, they have uh, a, a lot of teams 
they are uh, uh, playing this is uh, uh, like a sport. So uh, after creating as well the CSC, most of them asking their uh, HI to establish volleyball court because they are going to open area to playing this is uh, doing like the practice this is activity. So also the, uh, all the most the land in uh, Dukri, they are uh, contaminated by improvised explosive device. So I are going to establish this is a volleyball pitch in, in the area. Yeah, next please. Yeah. Um, also, uh, for, uh, like as a part of the quick uh, safety project or alternative behavior project, so uh, I is working in several areas and doing work, uh, for example, in Sinjar, in Barbaro's neighborhood. Uh, I observed that there is uh, several uh, small number of children who is working uh, and teenager who is working as a secret collector and about uh, most uh, like some num number of them, some children, they are affected by uh, LED explosion. Uh, so as I working on find alternative solution. So so most of this is also children. They are working as a scrub collector because uh, that's the situ economic situation of their family. So as I working on coordinate with uh, with another NGO uh, like NRC, which will provide vocational training for uh, the uh, for the community. So uh, we uh, invite uh, the parents and caregiver of those children uh, and engage them in vocational training with NRC. Uh, so uh, actually we have uh, we have success like cases of this children. So the three of the, of them they are believe this is uh, uh, what they are doing in in like and uh, and like working in in another uh, in another another thing actually. As well uh, in some community like in Wana in Tel Kiev and uh, in Tel Afar in some location, it, I uh, found there is uh, there is a lot of community uh, affected by explosive ordinance and they have a lot of victim uh, and uh, there is no health center or hospital near from their villages and should uh, like uh, take a, a long distance to reach the hospital or any health center. So HI provide first aid training for uh, some member of this community uh, to have a skill like to uh, to maybe assist the victim or injured people before uh, transport them to the hospital or health or, or health. Yes. Next, please. Yeah. Um, here we have another uh, alternative behavior project. Uh, implemented in uh, Sinjar in Tel uh, Azir. So here we have a uh, center uh, in Tel Azir. This is the center uh, led by uh, some volunteer from uh, the Tel Azir uh, area. Uh, so it's uh, working on rehabilitation. Uh, this is center as well, uh, uh, like install the solar cell and uh, Donate uh, a generator to uh, provide uh, the uh, electricity power for this center, as well uh, donate a lot of laptop for the volunteer they are using in their activity, uh, and uh, first aid a lot of first aid training for this is uh, center uh, to using in the activity because this is the volunteer in this uh, in this center they have. Uh, uh, a lot of skills, so they are provide English courses like a music course uh, as well. Uh, uh, they are uh, provide uh, explosive ordinance certification awareness session for the community of Tel Aviv and support the families when back to Tel Aviv from the And that's it. Thank you. Yes, hello, is. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to present you the main challenges, successes, and lessons learned we faced as part of this alternative behaviors project. So as I explained before, we started to use this approach in 2020. So we have almost four years now of experience for such projects. Let's see first what worked well as part of this kind of project. So first, creating safe spaces free from explosive ordnance, such as playground for children or a municipal park, 
is not only about decreasing the risk of explosive ordnance accidents amongst the community, but it also about providing a place where all people from the communities and from neighboring neighbor sorry, neighbor, neighboring communities can gather, meet, discuss, and create new connections. So such alternative behavior projects has proven its ability to promote social cohesion as well in communities and between neighboring communities as well. Um, in some of our community safety committees, especially in Kirkuk, where HI has, was also implementing land release activities, CSC members have benefited from several trainings, including on needs assessment, inclusion, and on advocacy. And after receiving those trainings, especially the one on needs assessment, community safety committee members have been able to develop the community safety plan uh, in which they identified the main issues for the communities uh, related to the use of the um, to the use of the land. So they identified uh, that the land was not used not only because of the contamination by explosive ordnance, but also because of the of two other issues, namely the ownership of the land that was not yet established and the irrigation channels that were broken. So regarding the irrigation channels, HI, in collaboration with Solidarity International and with the water department of the municipality, we repaired um, the irrigation channel um, as part of the alternative behavior project. And regarding the ownership of the land, um, uh, partly thanks to the advocacy training they received, CSC members have been able to advocate towards the local authorities to find a lasting, a lasting solutions. So in addition of the training mentioned, uh, they also received the mapping of the available services in their location. So they, can, they could uh, do themselves some referral of persons in needs uh, within their communities. Uh, so this exam example I just gave you uh, was to highlight actually the added value of such approach, in addition to create a space for dialogue within the communities and uh, to fully involve the the communities into the different mine action pillars activities we are implementing. It's also allowing them to liaise, to liaise with other actors such as INGOs or local authorities. Uh, what worked well as well uh, was the motivation of our community, uh, community focal points. I saw uh, that uh, some question in the chat were about the incentives for, C uh, for CFPs. Basically, we are not providing uh, financial compensation in Iraq for our community focal points, but we are providing uh, some transportation cost uh, incentives or mobile data cost, etc. But after several years of implement implementation of community focal points activity, we witnessed a strong motivation uh, of some of the people who've been trained uh, as CFPs. We recently provided a refresher training to people who did their CFP training like two or three years ago. And we have been happy to see that most of them were not only remembering all the messages regarding risk education, but most of them also continuing, continued to provide risk education session within their communities. So it has been a pretty good news for us. Um, the last notable success I wanted to, to share was uh, the fact that the both the CFP and the CSC methodologies have been validated by DMAC and by ICMA, so the mine action authorities in countries. Um, I will go quickly through the challenges. Uh, so of course we had some successes, but we also faced challenges for the implementation of such projects. Uh, so first, this kind of project brings the question of conflict sensitivity. So if it's community-based approach, uh, if this community-based approach put people at the center of our actions, it can also exacerbate uh, existing conflict within or between communities. To give you an example, when we do, when we did the rehabilitation of a municipal park in, in Mosul city, um, and while this project had been proposed by the CSC members, uh, we faced dissatisfaction uh, of neighbors who didn't want us to implement the project. So after discussion with those people, it appeared that they were afraid that the rehabilitation of the park will bring people from ISIS-affiliated families who were living in the neighboring uh, area to come into their, uh, their neighbor, neighborhood. So we had some discussion with the community members, with HI staff, with the CSC members, and we finally, went success, uh, we finally uh, found a solution 
so the renovation uh, could take place. And at the end, we realized that it brings communities to discuss those challenges instead of ignoring them. So <clears throat> it's uh, more or less um, a, still a success, let's say. Another difficulty we, we had, obviously, is the sustainability of such projects. So it brings the question of once the project is over, how to ensure that the, the maintenance of the places who have been created will uh, continue and how we, we will keep the community safety committees alive and active after the creation of the safe, safe space. So those are more, some challenges we, we faced. Another one is also the limited resources we have uh, financially, timely, technically to implement the project. So it raised the question of, on how uh, do we liaise with other operators uh, to mitigate these challenges. Um, besides, it has been sometimes hard to find a loan to, uh, to, to use for the creation of the safe spaces. For instance, uh, we went, um, we spent several weeks to find a suitable place to create a volleyball pitch in Sinja. And approval of local authorities also takes a lot of time, leading often to delays in the implementation of such projects. Finally, it's also sometimes challenging to be gender balanced. Uh, it's harder to reach women as part of CSC and as part of CFP activities. I will very quickly go to things to improve. So now that we get this experience, uh, where do we need to go? First, we need to improve our coordination with government entities. We need to involve them more in such projects and not only for uh, authorizations or accredit uh, agreements. Um, also, we need to improve the sustainability of such projects in terms of mainten maintenance of the safe spaces, but also in terms of follow-up and support to the CSC. So we are currently discussing about using such committees to propose conflict transformation or social cohesion activities, and therefore capitalize on the creation of such committees for further uh, resilience projects. We also uh, like to propose uh, additional trainings to the CSC to the CSC members, um, first generalize the proposition of uh, CFP training, advocacy training, needs assessment training, et cetera, to all CSC members in Iraq, and extends the training component to other topics as well. And finally, we need to develop a proper impact assessment tool for such approach. Today, we are um, assessing the impact of, the, of this kind of project through the traditional CAP survey. But such tool does not allow to assess the this approach in uh, its globality. So we are trying to work on a, a proper impact assessment tool for that. Uh, here's what we wanted to share with you. We are running out of time, so I'm not sure we will have the time to reply to all your questions. Um, do the CSC safety projects only focus on providing alternative to unsafe behavior, or do they also give an input on other things, for example, identifying priority areas for marking clearance risk Yes, actually, we are working on that also as part of the community safety plan they are um, um, developing. Maybe Hanin or Sophia, you want you to, to reply a bit more on, on that question at least. Sorry, it's the last it one I've, I've seen. Eloise, sorry, uh, just, uh, I don't want to cut you. I'm just uh, going to, to say that it's super interesting and we have many questions in the chat. Uh, I think we're already a bit late in terms of time. Yeah. So I would propose maybe that we continue with the questions and we will skip the networking circle for this time. Uh, I hope it will not make too like create too many frustration with the participants, but I think we we have a lot of uh, very interesting questions. So if we can take maybe like one or two or two or three questions maximum from the chat, and the rest will be answered in writing. And uh, like this, we can we can finish on times with a few questions. Okay, sounds good to me. So regarding the CSC safety project, so as I was explaining, indeed, we are also working on identifying priority areas for marking clearance risk education as part of the community safety plan CSC members are developing. Um, another question was how you collect the report from community volunteers. Do you enter to IMSMA and how will you do the QA for the activities? Uh, maybe Hanin or Sofia, do you want to, to reply to this question? I can jump in and reply. Um, at the moment, we are not collecting 
a specific report from the activities that they conduct, and they are this is not being reported in the in the IMSMA system. So we follow up. Um, we make a registration of the activities where we do QA, but um, it's planned for the future. But for now, we are not uh, yeah asking them a specific report. So we are not reporting as benef as direct beneficiaries or as beneficiaries the the people that is being trained during those sessions. But it's planned. We just need to find out the best way of doing it. Um, yes, yeah, so another question was, do the CFP continue conducting risk education activities after the end of the project? And if yes, how does it try and show sustainability and the quality of the activities delivered by the CFPs after the end of the project? Um, basically, yes, as uh, we were explaining, some of our some of our community focal point continue conducting risk education activities after the end of the project. Um, we are trying to keep contact with them even after the project because we have uh, usually all the risk education projects in place. So, and sometimes instead of, um, as part of our new risk education project, instead of selecting new community focal points, we will um, uh, consider to provide refresher training to the existing community focal points we have in place and making sure we will support them as well. So as part of the new project, the upcoming project, we are trying to take them into account, providing them the support they are needing or um, QA visits if, if feasible. Um, yes, uh, hello, uh, yeah. I need to add point here. So uh, also regarding the uh, community focal point, we always continue with the MSU WhatsApp channel. So always we share with them updates, messages, uh, the uh, accident happened. Uh, also, they are share some accident happened in their community with us. As well, we uh, try as much as we can to, con to contact workshop with the community focal point who is active and willing to participate in this workshop in, in, uh, in each year with the CFP. Thank you. Um... How does HI assess the impact of the alternative behavior projects? Uh, are they linked with the government to guarantee maintenance or to have more budget available? So for that, uh, as we were explaining, currently we are assessing the impact of those projects only through the CAP survey, but we are working on um, a new tool in order to impact this kind of project more globally. So it's still a work in progress. Um, do the community safety committee projects only focus on providing alternative to unsafe behavior? We already replied to this question. Um, is there a role for victims of EO and for VA organizations in social behavior change communication and in community safety committees when victims are in the community, given they often have powerful stories to, uh, of that experience? Maybe Sofia or Hanin, if you want to go through this uh, question. Mm. Uh, we promote that the, um, that the CSC um, is inclusive. So we promote the inclusion of victims uh, or in general persons with disability in the committee. Um, it's a negotiation. It requires a lot of uh, raising awareness among the community about the importance of including uh, this population in the in the CSC. And at the end is the community who, who is choosing the members. So it's the same issue, uh, it's the same challenge, I would say, to include both women and persons with disability in the CSC because we encourage it, um, we raise a lot of awareness, but still we struggle to make it happen, uh, to make it a reality, it happens in some in some of the of the CSCs, and maybe Hanin can explain uh, in more detail. But it's not always the case. Uh, something really important is that we liaise um, the activities that we do, if we uh, also with victim assistance activities that we are conducting in the area. So if we have a project. Uh, for rehabilitation or uh, mental health and psych psychosocial support. Uh, we try to liaise the, the, the people that we identify while we are doing the sessions and the activities 
and liaise them and refer them uh, to the services. And also we have provided um, information about the available services to the CSE for them to circulate this information. But the participation, like the active participation, uh, it's, um, in, it's included. We do some efforts, but it's still a challenge. It's, it's an ongoing process, I would say. And maybe a last question. Uh, how long is the plan made by the community safety committees? Do you want to, to reply again, uh, Sofia or Hani? How, sorry, can you repeat? How long is the plan made by the community safety committee? But maybe if I can uh, jump in, there is no um, time, uh, um, time frame for, for this community safety plan, actually. This is more about uh, a list of uh, what are the main challenges for the communities and how we could try to tackle those risks. So there is no proper time, time frame uh, as part of this community safety plan. But maybe Hanin or Sofia, you can provide a bit more details uh, on that. Yes. Um, yeah, no, as you mentioned, there is no specific time frame. Um, it's uh, really tied to, I mean, the plan for the community doesn't have like the time a time frame, but one of the challenges is to make it uh, sustainable after we finalize the activities, after we finish the project. So if we have the chance of continuity, we can follow up and keep pushing the plan. Uh, but it's still a challenge to to make it uh, continuing after we finalize the the project, uh, and that's why one one of the things to improve that uh, you were mentioning, Eloise, with like, how can we liaise this better with other actors in the area and with local authorities so we could give a, a longer uh, yeah, duration of the, of the activities. I think we, we will not have time to reply to the other questions. So first in the floor is yours if you want to. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Eloise, Sophia, and Hanin uh, for the great presentations. This was very interesting, and I think we it, it shows in the in the chat also with a number of questions. Uh, so thank you very much for your time today, and thank you also to all participants for your questions, for the interest in the subjects, uh, and we hope you had a great time uh, during this webinar. Um, as we said, for the pending questions, uh, we will gather the questions in the chat and the pending questions will be answered in writing by Eloise, Sofia and Hanin and the response will be circulated at a later date. Um, so this will end today's Yori Hour, just an information that we will have a last Yori Hour webinar for this year, 2023, next month uh, in November and it will be presented by CRS Vietnam on digital uh, application, on a digital application and digital practice. So we hope you enjoy today's webinar. Again, uh, thank you very much to all of you. And I will conclude this webinar this year hour. Thank you very much and have a good, a good day and take care of you. you. Bye. Thank you.